Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for our next installment of our Red Hen Press Reading and Conversation Series. I'm Monica Fernandez. And I'm Toby Harper. And we're incredibly excited to bring this conversation to you this evening. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which Toby and I are broadcasting from is the occupied and seized territory of the Gabrielino, Tongva, and Keech people. These native tribes have a rich history, having been one of the most influential people at the time of European colonization and genocide. We encourage you to learn more about these tribes and the native people of the land you're watching us from. As a starting point, we're dropping a link that will help you to identify what native land you're on. Please feel free to check it out and acknowledge what land you're on in the comments of whatever platform you're watching from. To continue our land acknowledgements, we're proud to introduce Jason Schneiderman, an incredible Red Hen poet, professor, and our moderator tonight. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Hi. And yes, I am coming to you from Brooklyn, um, which is the unceded territory of the Lenape peoples. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Bryn Saito. Um, like any good American, writes Bryn Saito, I bathe my television in total attention. Saito's voice is unique in American poetry, at once ironic and, and sincere, quiet but ecstatic, rounded but visionary, using language to bridge the boundaries between the feeling and observing self and the national we, or our idea of the national we, and the ways that we can include and exclude. Saito blends the natural world with the technological, following the associative tissues of lives across the multiple strands that feel almost prophetic in this moment of pandemic, when we have all become part cyborg, our laptops, extensions of our bodies, and our social life flattened by screens that lack the warmth of paper pages and books. Saito's voice is not one of contradiction, but synthesis. She's a visionary whose work has helped me see more clearly the way we live now. Bryn Saito is the author of two books of poetry from Red Hen Press, Power Made Us Swoon, and The Palace of Contemplating Departure, winner of the Benjamin Saltman Award and a finalist for the National California Book Award. Her, her poems have appeared in the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and American Poetry Review. Along with Nikiko Masumoto, Bryn co-founded Yonsei Memory Project, which was featured in the 2019 Vogue article, Memory Keepers, Japanese American Interment Survivors and Descendants Speak Out. She is an assistant professor of creative writing in the English department at California State University, Fresno. Please help me welcome Bryn Saito. Thank you so much, Jason. Hello, everybody. I'm calling in today from Ojai, California, which is located on the unceded territory of the Chumash people. And Jason, I'm I'm just really moved by your introduction and so happy to be here with both you and David. Um, David is a mentor of mine, somebody so important to me and I'm a huge fan of yours, Jason, and it's just an honor to be in conversation with both of you. Um, thinking about today, the ballad um, and narrative poetry. So I thought I'd read um, just two, two pieces to start us off before um, we welcome David into the conversation. Um, as you mentioned, um, Nikiko Masumoto and I work uh, co-founded Yonsei Memory Project, and Yonsei uh, in Japanese means fourth generation, four. Um, so we're fourth generation Japanese Americans, and we recently formed this organization to sort of think about how to carry forward the stories of our those who were incarcerated during the Japanese American incarceration during World War II. My grandparents um, were about 22 years old when they were sent to camp. Um, they called it camp, the prison camps in Gila River, Arizona. And Gila River is located on the sovereign territory of the Gila River Indian community. So just these layers, you know, of, of history. And so many of my poems um, tell those stories or have I've done a lot of work interviewing elders, trying to learn about that time, a lot of research, of course. And so my poetry draws from those those stories um, to just process some of the, I think the trauma of that time and also just create um, new visions and new um, language, I guess, to describe what it's like 
to be sort of descended from that history of both struggle and and survival and resilience. Um, so the the narrative form has helped me, I think, do that through the years. Of course, I write a lot of lyric poetry as well, like a lot of contemporary poets, um, a lot of just you know, sort of feeling into that subjective I. Um, but the narrative poems sort of reach for that we um, try to attempt to kind of call in a collective history as, as difficult as that is to, to sort of summon a we and speak for a we. Um, so this poem I'll start with is in my second book, Power Made a Swoon, um, which was published by Red Hen. And um, it takes the persona, so it's a little bit outside of narrative poetry. It's not that third person point of view, but it takes on the I persona um, but it takes on the persona of a point of point of view of a stone. So it's an inhabited inhabiting the consciousness of the stone and imagining, you know, what did the stone see in those deserts? What did the stone feel when those prisons were going up, when they saw my grandparents, you know, walk into those spaces, et cetera. Just this imaginative act, trying to imagine what the stone might have seen. Um, so I'll I'll read that poem to you all now and apologize for my spotty internets. Um, hopefully it'll stick, stick through here. Um, this is Stone in the Desert Camp, 1942. Between the turtle rock and the crane rock, the children found me, and I was shining and smooth and silent about my secrets. One day above me, men with bony shoulders came and built the barracks. Then I couldn't see the sky for the rising camps, and I couldn't feel the winds whipping between the ranges, and I couldn't see the ranges. After a short time, voices moved in, and I heard singing. Months later, dancing. But mostly what caught me was the quiet, concentrated chatter of elders, how long before a working stove, how to make a garden in this cradle, of limestone, how to coax a stream from the highest of peaks in the freest of nations. In this nation, we sought for the blinding. Some days, no one heard the tears, but I felt them. They coated me like evidence of a prior sea. I thought this must be how the humans felt when the rains broke above them every 200 days and the waters for once didn't leak through their roofs and they were happy. So that poem, you know, sort of uses those those markers of the narrative. Um, one day this happened, and then this happened, and first this happened, and then this, um, to sort of just summon a picture of, of, of life and a story from that time. And this next poem, I'll final, uh, my final poem of the evening, um, which we might talk a little bit about later, is this poem I wrote for something called the People's Inauguration. And this was spearheaded by my really great friend Valerie Kaur, who's an activist and a lawyer. And she wanted to hold this event sort of after the presidential inauguration in January, the days following, what would it be like to have an inauguration for we the people? What would it mean for all of us as people to take individual oaths, you know, in the service of rising to all of the crises of this moment? What would it mean to sort of make a promise, you know, to be in service of a, a vision of a better, better world? And so she called on me and said, hey, can you write an opening poem for this? Um, like an inaugural poem. And it was the first time I'd written an occasion poem and learned how difficult it is to do that, um, to both be honest, but also somehow also kind of hopeful, um, especially during a moment where I didn't maybe feel a lot of hope or I was just, you know, we're all feeling so much, there's so much going on. Um, how do you begin to tap into that collective energy and, and sort of speak poetry from that place? Um, it was a difficult task and we sort of co-wrote this poem together. Close with the reading of this poem, uh, the People's Inauguration poem, it's a blessing and called it a blessing for the People's Inauguration. This morning you woke to Wren Song in the House of Winter. There was tea or there wasn't. There were sirens coating the avenues or snows packed hard against glass or western sunlight lacing the haze of a coastal sky. There were fires followed by freezing, followed by sickness, followed by war. So you went into the garden or you shuddered before the television or you dressed again for the front lines in this unsheltered season of gunmetal grief. 
but the force of your loneliness is an omen, and every oath tells a new story. It's the story of a daughter stepping to the mic at the century's beginning and reciting her future. It's the story of a dreamer with their bone-tired body still turning towards wonder. It's the vision of a son unbroken by night and lifting a spoon to his mother's mouth and healing. It's the story of we the people, grieving and strong, breathing through the fires of this country's transitions while tending to history's wounds. We inhabit with power every shade of light, take up paintbrush and plow and voice and pen to labor for a home that's never been, though we see it on the cusp of our dreaming. This shoreline, this shoreline is a threshold. We can almost taste the sea. Dear steady accomplice, will you stand beside me and call in the future with your prodigal heart? Dear country at a crossroads, will you bloom with the songs of your ancestors like a lotus in a mud pit, floating with the spirit of a bloodless protest? Dear grandmother and grandfather, I remember your struggles. What right have I to forget? Step with me into the freedom field. We've made it this far. By beloved deliverance, let us sing this country into its new beginning. Let's regenerate with the pain of our love the unimagined world. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Bryn. That was really wonderful. Um, and so now it is my pleasure to introduce our second um, conversant of the evening, poet David Mason. David Mason is a master of American prosody working in and championing forms of verse that one might call formal. And while formal needs no apology, I do want to explain that his verse is formal in the way that you see celebrities wearing formal dress at the annual Met Gala. That is not to say that the rules are not restrictive, but rather that the restraint might be the precondition of freedom, ecstasy, and discovery. In Mason's work, his distinctive voice traces the personal and natural world and reading his poems is like watching an athlete with whom you've become intimately familiar over years, always himself, always new, always riveting. David Mason grew up in Bellingham, Washington, and has lived in many parts of the world, including Greece and Colorado, where he served as Poet Laureate for four years. He and his trusty Subaru visited 60 out of 64 countries in that state, bringing poetry to audiences in and out of jails, schools, and other kinds of confinement. His books of poems are many. Um, his verse novel, Ludlow, was named Best Poetry Book of the Year by the Contemporary Poetry Review and the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. He has written a memoir and three collections of essays. His poetry, prose, and translations have appeared in periodicals, including The New Yorker, Harper's, The Nation, The New Republic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal. The list goes on for a very long time. Um, he lives with his partner, Chrissy, the poet Callie Conan, Conan Davis, on lands that they cleared together in Tasmania, where they look out on water in three directions and are kept sane by the behavior, by the behavior of the birds and animals and the occasional human. David, welcome. It's so great to um, bring you to the space. Thank you, Jason. That's just marvelous. It's good, to, it's good to see you. I heard you read in Los Angeles years ago and you were just a knockout. You were really hilarious. Thank and I, I'm really proud of the fact that I helped choose uh, Bryn's first book for publication, and I love her work, and it's really great to be part of this, this session with the two of you. Um, I'm going to read three bits uh, and uh, try to be economical about it. I'm, I'm thinking about stories and forms, and uh, I've always thought that stories were forms, that stories have shapes, and among the things we're thinking about when we talk about the shapes of stories are who's telling this story and who's the story being told to and why are we telling it? I think it was beautiful the way Bryn brought up the we that's involved in stories, that sense that we're speaking about a community, et cetera, as well as individuals. This is a strange story that started with something somebody told me years ago. And, and I'll tell you, I'm reading it because it's in the form of a sonnet or a, a loose sonnet, but it's a story, you know, and it's called The Teller. It's in this book, The Sound. He told me, 
maybe 30 years ago, he'd met a raw-boned Eskimo named Jack while filming polar bears on an ice floe. Jack went out fishing in his sealskin kayak, but the current carried him so far off course that when a Russian freighter rescued him, they signed him as a mate to Singapore. Five years at sea it took to get back home. The year an Englishman gave him his name. The year of hustling on a Bali beach. The year of opium in Vietnam. The year he pined for snow. The year he searched for any vessel that would turn toward Nome. The man who told me? I tell you, I don't know. Now, that's kind of a meditation on what stories are. I'm going to read another uh, meditative poem that involves story. And this is from my next book, which will be called Pacific Light, that Red Hen will publish in 2022. The end of stories, it starts with an absolutely true anecdote, and then it just kind of branches off from it. And again, it's another short poem dealing with story. I used to know his name the fisherman who chainsawed a skylight in my mother's roof. Not your ideal tenant, she dryly said. I knew he dealt to high school kids and led the life of someone people thought was cool, a name at parties where I never went. So that was who he was, a leaky roof, one legendary season on a boat and final buying trip to Mexico where all the storytelling thinned to silence or fell out headless on a desert road. New stories rose and someone else's weed clouded our nights until the fire went out. I couldn't stand the stuff and gave it up, resealed the skylight in my mother's roof and slept beneath it and the summer moon and all the lunacy the country offered. The end of stories comes for everyone, but not for stories. They go on living out somewhere under a light of their own. So I'm thinking about, you know, shapes of stories, etc., And we'll be talking about ballads as we go on. But another kind of story has a great deal of length to it. Ludlow could even be called an epic poem. It sounds kind of preposterous, but uh, and it's pretty hard to represent something of, of length, a novel in verse or an epic poem in a, in, a, in a short broadcast like this. But when we're thinking about the shapes of stories, we're thinking about them the way novelists do as well. Um, and uh, so that there's a form in the arc in the duration and the time it takes to tell a story. I can't possibly represent this to you in a short thing, but I'm just gonna read you a, sh a, a scene from Ludlow. This is a scene early in the book. A little girl named Louisa Mole has just been orphaned and the community of immigrants in Southern Colorado, at this point, it's about 1912 or so, are trying to decide what to do with this little girl. Um, and uh, she'll be a hinge in the book. Uh, she'll be somebody who grew up among immigrants and goes to live with the sort of middle-class business folks in the town of Trinidad in Southern Colorado. And, uh, and so she always feels divided between the immigrants among whom she grew up and the more settled folks, uh, the business class folks in the town. This takes a few minutes to read, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on right after this. So here's a scene. Casamiento de pobres, fábrica de limoneros. A marriage of the poor is a factory of beggars. Senora Robles said it like the scripture, watching her own young ruffians at play. She turned back to the stoop where Luisa sat beside two apple crates of her possessions. La pobrecita, always waiting for men. Luisa watched the others watching her as she had done at her father's funeral the short march of neighbors to the dry hill of wooden markers, words of kindness spoken for the girl a good man left behind. He's gone, he's gone, don't look, don't ever look. 
Senora Robles cooked food like her mother's with jalapenos and black beans, while Too Tall on occasion brought a rabbit home for stew. She hated evenings when he went to work as her father had, taking the path up while Robles and his diggers limped back down. She noticed Mrs. McIntosh would keep her thin hands busy as she could to calm her mind. Even that sinewy Glaswegian who had borne two living children was afraid. Now I'm going to cut a stanza and just move ahead. Too Tall had said her future was arranged and everyone was safe. What did he mean? Why did the older women watch her so and chase the boys away with angry words in Mexican or Scots, brandishing sticks to wave them off? She waited on the stoop, her skirted knees held close as if to guard her body from the eyes. What wasn't said? Word reached the Pluck Me store in Cedar Hill, where Mrs. Reed, who had four daughters, lay pregnant, confined to bed by a company doctor. She'd lost a son last year and couldn't bear, they said, to lose another. She had a four-room clabbered house, a well for water, and space beside the kitchen stove where a thing as slight as young Louisa Mole could throw a pillow and her blankets down to sleep. In time, perhaps, they'd build a bunk. The girl could cook, clean house, and mind the children in exchange for shelter in a Christian home. It was arranged. While others crammed her house, Louisa waited with her boxed-up goods beside her as the buckboard wagon drew nearer on the road. She saw the man who drove, his straw hat shading half his face. She saw two tall Mackintosh on foot beside the wagon, talking to the man. The straw hat nodding, coat and tie, though it was hot. Her future coming close. The enemy so she used to think, a man of scrip and heavy prices, cursed by mining folk, a stranger, Mr. Reed. Louisa, too tall, stooped to touch her hair. Lass, this man's your new employer. Chin up. Let's look at you. She saw the man's good shoes when he stepped down, the trousers, buttoned vest. George Reed, said Mr. Reed. Don't be afraid. He swung his hat off. A man of 30 years with blue eyes and a blonde mustache. His hair parted almost down the middle. That's it. Good girl. His mustache bristled when he smiled. He's not much older than mine. You say she can read? She's had it hard, said Too Tall. There's plenty around here's had it hard, said Mr. Reed. But we can use the help if she can work. You can work, can't you? Young lady, Louisa, right? Louisa, you can work, can't you? Louisa nodded. I had a girl, good girl. They loaded up her apple crates of clothing, Bible, the wooden santo her mother brought from a village far away, the carver's name made shiny by the rub of hands, abuelo. No tiene uno ni madre, said a voice behind her. Good lass, good lassie, wear card and don't forget us, said Mrs. Goodbye, said the house, the hens, the risen dust. So thanks for listening. That's a, a little sense of some, uh, some narrative forms that might relate to what we can talk about as we go on. Thank you so much. Um, those readings were both gorgeous. Um, I, I kind of want to just sit with them, but we do have to have a conversation. So <laughs> I will jump in. Um, and I wanted to start with a two-part question just to kind of frame um, the conversation. And I wanted to ask you both if you could share your working definitions of the word narrative and the word ballad, um, and particularly if those terms are in opposition to something else like narrative and not lyric or narrative and not elegy. Um, and also, could you just talk about what it means to you to kind of work in those modes to kind of use the narrative or the ballad? I'm, I'm gonna jump in and just say a few things about ballad. I'm sorry, my reading just now took a, a little longer than I expected. And I want to read a ballad uh, by a, a contemporary poet, Marilyn Nelson. So I might just take a few minutes here, if you don't mind. I want to start by just saying a few stanzas from a Scottish ballad 
traditional, the wife of Usher's well. And just notice something about how this story opens. It's a traditional ballad stanza, four beats, three beats, four beats, three beats, every other line rhymed. And ballads, of course, are not all written in that stanza, but here's one. There lived a wife at Usher's well, and a wealthy wife was she. She had three stout and stalwart sons and sent them o'er the sea. They hadn't have been a week from her, a week but barely ain, when word came to the carl and wife that her three sons were gain. They hadn't have been a week from her, a week but barely three, when word came to the carl and wife that her sons she'd never see. I wish the winds may never cease, nor fashes in the flood, till my three sons come home to me in earthly flesh and blood. Now it goes on, and the story has an arc. It's a ghost story. It's about, it's about immigration. It's about people who leave home and die in a faraway country and only come back as ghosts. So it's a poem about identity. It's a poem about being Scottish, being immigrant, etc. But notice that the things that are going on in that poem are the incredible economy of storytelling in verse. We don't have to get information about who the wife was. Um, we don't have to get information about where she was sitting, what the house looked like, what the weather was like, anything like that. We move immediately from narrative detail into her speaking voice. She just speaks. And the other thing is notice the repetition. They hadn't been a week from her, a week but barely ain. They hadn't been a week from her, a week but barely three. Now, here's a contemporary narrative poem by Marilyn Nelson. It's from her book, The Home Place, which I think was published in the in the 1990s. Marilyn's a wonderful poet who has done so many different kinds of things. Uh, the Home Place is a, is a book of poems about that follows her family from slave times to World War II and, and the aftermath of World War II and African-American experience. But it's made of short lyrics, uh, sonnets, ballads, villanelles, free verse, etc. So it's narrative and verse mixed in. This just happens to be one poem in the book, and it's about Aunt Geneva. And it mentions another character in the book, a guy named Pomp. Uh, I won't explain it. But notice how she's using the ballad tradition. She, notice how she's using stanzas. It's, it's mostly three beat lines in this case, but how she uses repetition, song repetition. So song and story are melded. They come together. This is what the blues does. There's a lot of the blues in Marilyn's poem. And this is what rap and hip hop are doing, right? Telling stories in, in song, in verse. Geneva was a wild one. Geneva was a tart. Geneva met a blue-eyed boy and gave away her heart. Geneva ran a roadhouse. Geneva wasn't sent to college like the others. Pomp's pride, her punishment. She cooked out on the river, watching the shore slide by. Her lips pursed into hardness, her deep set brown eyes dry. She, she killed a woman over a good black man by braining the jealous heifer with an iron frying pan. They say when she was 80, she got up late at night and sneaked her old white lover in to make love and to fight. First they heard the telltale singing of the springs. Then Geneva's voice rang out, I need to buy some things. So next time, bring more money and bring more moxie too. I ain't got no time to waste on limp white men's like you. Oh yeah, well, Mr. White Man, it sure might be stone white, but you, my thing's white as it yours is, and you know damn well I'm right. Now listen, take your heart pills and pay the doctor mind. If you up and die on me, I'll whip your white behind. They tiptoed through the parlor on heavy, time-slowed feet. She watched him from her front door, walked on the dawnlit street. Geneva was the wild one. Geneva was the tart. Geneva met a blue-eyed boy and gave away her heart. So there it is. The ballad tradition, Scots-Irish stuff coming into America through folk song, through everything else. Joining, anybody can pick up these forms. Anybody can use them uh, to tell their stories. Thank you for that, David. I love, <laughs> just love hearing. Yeah, I could just, I mean, that's the beauty of the ballad form and so many of these traditional verse metered rhymed forms is there's a pleasure listening. Um, I think Bob Hass or Robert Haas talks about that, the being 
just the, the the charm of rhyme and the pleasure and the the way you get sort of enchanted and we I feel I feel you know enchanted by that reading and um yeah I'll just add that that I love that connection um between poetry and song and just remembering you know across so many cultures right poetry begins in song the sijo in korean the hazel in persia um and we, this collective we of humanity, you know, we sang songs to each other as a way to carry forward, right, our cultural histories and our stories. And that's, there was this, this is during oral culture before any written language. And this is how we did it. We sat around, um, you know, not, of course, not on Zoom, but together, <laughs> they together and sang songs. And um, the, the ballad was, yeah, this carrier of, of history and story and legend and myth. Um, I love that about it. Um, and then, yeah, with narrative poetry, you know, a good starting place for those definitions for me is always thinking about, you know, Aristotle's categories, flawed as they are, you know, with my students, I begin there, the, the narrative versus maybe the lyric and that subjective subjective eye. Um, and then, of course, the uh What's the third one? Narrative, epic, and dramatic, dramatic. <laughs> um, thinking about like the great sort of plays. And so those what those Western categories are a starting place for me to think about how to to kind of sort those in my mind. And then and then how to sort of break them and play with them and and bring them into this modern, this modern setting. Can I, can I ask you to talk, or both of you, to talk a little bit more about the oral and the written and the way that those two, two things are kind of working together? Because um, I do think there's a, there's a really interesting shift that's happening. And when we were reading the ballad and when you're reading the kind of um, formal poems, one of the things that is really um, clear is the way in which the meter as kind of coming out of the song guides the syntax. It guides the way, what you stress, how you, you know, work on the, the intonation of the sentence. And um, and now we're actually kind of at a point, like, um, when I when I was researching um, for tonight and when I was kind of going through things, um, when I found your poems on um, the Academy of American Poets, that poem a day, you know, which goes to like hundreds of thousands of people. Now, the, the later one from I think 2018 did have a recording of you and the one from 2013 did not. Um, and that, you know, David, you know, sending something out into the world as a poem in you know, the 1990s or the 2000s, that there was, I mean, now we, we really have um, access to a kind of recording technology that's really um, come into poetry land. And I, just, mm. I was curious what your thoughts are about the ways in which that oral tradition and that written tradition have been kind of working in and out and then are kind of reaching, you know, at maybe a different place. You go first, Bryn. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think technology has shifted, you know, I think about writing as a technology, writing as this groundbreaking technology. And, and we've seen just in the last year, five years, 10 year, every, every four years, there seems to be a new generation of technology and, um, and even platforms like Twitter and Instagram are changing poetry, you know, just the space of the poem. You have both these shorter poems um, and then and then we're back to the infinite scroll and then these ways in which, um, yeah, video and oral, there's a certain, like my students, right? They can access these readings by poets so easily now and beautiful readings, real well recorded. And I find all I want to really do in class is show those because that's how I came alive to poetry, you know, when we actually meet in class settings, but that's how I came alive to poetry was going to the New York and Poets Cafe, you know, and just like sitting there and being in the word, just being in the the lance, the, the, the sound of those rhythms and that meter. Um, so I think it, for me as an educator, I'm seeing just the benefits of that. And also, again, like some of these technologies, some of the downfalls as well. And I'm so curious to see where we'll be, you know, in the next couple of years with all of this. But yeah, David, yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Well, I, you know, when I, f I didn't start teaching creative writing until I was in my 40s uh, and I got a job in Colorado. And when I first got that job, I was confronted with students and colleagues who thought I must be some sort of a fascist because I enjoyed things like rhyme and meter. 
And I was like, good God, man. I mean, is Bob Dylan a fascist? Is Emily Dickinson a fascist? What are you talking about? What is this nonsense? Why should I give up things that I loved? And why, why, do you, why do you think it's a political stance to rhyme something? You know, that's nuts. Um, and what's happened since then is this really great cultural revolution of a, a kind of return to orality. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the poet and critic Jack Foley up in Oakland, California, has been writing about this for 20 years or, or more uh, and, and experimenting with uh, notions of, of oral culture. Um, and I think it's fabulous. It's just fabulous. As you say, Bryn, I think, I think you're right that we also really need that relationship with the written culture, too. Uh, um, I love Anne Carson's first book, her scholarly book called Eros, the Bittersweet, about Sappho. Uh, and Carson has wonderful things to say about the evolution of writing uh, and how it emerges in the history of the Greek language and how the consonant uh, in the alphabet is invented to kind of create definition between all these vowel sounds, et cetera. Uh, and, and writing then uh, really helps us guide uh, and shape uh, you know, all the kinds of things we're doing in language. And so I, I think the marriage of orality and writing is, is where it's at. Mm -hmm. I think a, a purely oral culture can sometimes end up with a kind of superficial poetry or a poetry that that doesn't uh, use language with the kind of intensity it sometimes needs and deserves. Um, it's just, you know, not always the case, but sometimes it's the case. But a purely written poetry with, without any sense of the need to perform it, the need to put the voice to it, would really be just dead on the page from, from my point of view. Now, of course, there's lots of other poetry. There's visual poetry and blah, blah, blah. But I love, I love that place where the oral and written live together uh, and dance together, as it were. My, my favorite thing that Carson says in Eros the Bittersweet is that um, the written writing forces the person to confront themselves as a stranger. That if you're telling a story, then you're always in communication and you're always, you know, kind of participating. But writing requires that you um, shut yourself off from the group in order to kind of look at something. And that when you're looking at something yeah. you yourself have written, when you go back and read your diaries from when you were 14, you know, in a contemporary sense, you encounter yourself as a stranger. That when we read our own poems, that that the written kind of provides a strangeness for the self that the oral often. Um, does not, and that that's the that's that transition from the epic Fantastic. to the lyric. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I had a question mm -hmm. in both of your poems, um, or in both in poems that you both read. Um, there was an anthropomorphic anthropomorphification. Obviously, I didn't write this down, so I apologize. I think I put too many syllables in that word. But um, Brent, there was a poem where the stone became a kind of personality, and um, David, in your in your poem about stories, the stories became, they had a personality, right? Mm. The, the stories themselves took on um, a kind of being selfhood. And I was wondering if you would, if you would kind of talk about how, if, I, I mean, I have a personal theory that sort of like storytelling makes us project humanity onto things that might not be human. But I, I would love to hear your thoughts about what story and narrative do in that sense in your own work. Yeah, that's great observation. Yeah, the stories and the stones <laughs> came alive in those moments. Um, it's funny, I'm actually teaching, after this, I'm teaching my my poetry class and we're gonna talk about eco-poetry. And, um, and one of my kind of all those things I'm wrestling with ethically too is, is that anthropomorphization <laughs> or whatever, you know, just like doing that. Um, um, can the stone just be the stone, you know, can I just, can you, can you confront it in this way that doesn't, you know, put the human onto everything. At the same time though, I think about like animism in Shinto culture or, you know, indigenous cultures where there is an animated, animating force, you know, in, in these elements and in the world around us that 
oftentimes um, we, yeah, for various kind of reasons, we've, we've cut ourselves off from. Um, so sometimes I, I feel that force in, in these non-human elements and I want to engage with them somehow. I do that in ways also that are, eth yeah, ethically sound. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's like that impulse is in me and I, I wrestle with it. And, and also I, I felt at the time the stones were the only way for me to, to tell that story. Um, it was, those were difficult kind of stories to confront and the stone gave me a, a way to kind of share some of those memories and those stories in my family's history. And then I realized, yeah, later on, of course, the stone has such a significance in Japanese culture and Japanese gardening. My father collects stones, has been collecting stones for decades and has this garden of stones. And, and the stone sort of also signifies um, the, that kind of resilience and strength that allowed maybe them to kind of get through that time. So all those metaphors starting to come together and all those questions, but great question, yeah. Yeah, uh, Brenda. Yeah, I, I love working with stone too. Uh, your father and I have a lot in common. I'm a mason in more ways than one. <laughs> you know, I was so concerned about uh, time when we started this that I forgot to do my welcome to country and note that I am sitting here in the unceded land of the Malukerdi people who are uh, part of the Palawa language group. But it's per it pertains to this question too. This is the... the uh, Malukerdi people were from from this region in Tasmania. Um, so I'm speaking on Thursday morning um, in, uh, on the other side of the world. And uh, I, I think the, the effort in the world to learn from indigenous cultures now is one of the most important developments in modern history. Um, and there's a great, great, great uh, document I encourage everyone to Google and look up called the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is the uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, request of Aboriginal people in Australia to be recognized um, and acknowledged. And it's ongoing in this country and there's a weird resistance to it in some ways. It, it pertains to Jason's point about, uh, you know, the, uh, the pathetic fallacy or this way we have of projecting the human onto the world. Uh, and I think maybe we who intellectualize that process are perhaps in the wrong, um, that we need to understand reality differently. Uh, and that maybe poetry and writing um, in, in a kind of innocent fashion uh, are involved in this process. Um, I was taking a workshop on fire, using fire to maintain the health of your land from a young Aboriginal fellow a f couple of months ago. And as he was talking to the group of my neighbors and I here, uh, he um, uh, looked up at a tree where a honey honey eater, a bird, was flitting in the tree. And he said, my grandfather is looking down on me, um, right? And what is that? Uh, what is that storytelling? What is that sense we have when we look at an animal and say, maybe that's my dead brother. Um, maybe that's my grandfather. Maybe that's my mother. Um, I think there's a, a kind of blessedness in that consciousness. Um, call it a delusion if you want, but running around calling things delusions just seems to deaden um, the whole process uh, of being alive in the world. Um, so I, I sort of count myself a would-be animist. Um, I feel life that way, and, and I write that way, it's, uh, un unapologetically. And I think it brings you back to narrative, right? That, that in, yeah. in saying, um, I see the soul um, present in this other um, being, that that's a different story 
about the world and how the world works. And I mean, it's, one of the things that I find really fascinating about the ballad that you were calling attention to earlier is that if, if things are quite homogenous, um, if everyone shares a kind of background knowledge culture, then you don't have to do very much explanation. That you can just, you know, sort of jump right in and everyone's on the same page because there are there are so many shared understandings. But then part of what's fascinating is that the further you get from those, the the, the more work there is to kind of go back and, and reshape out the story, to kind of extrapolate what that story is from the pieces that you're receiving. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I think the sense of, you know, as the romantics have all these metaphors for the organic nature of art and the organic nature of the world, I love those things. Um, uh, because it feels to me, even when we're using all of our mechanical instruments, our mathematics, our measurements, our et cetera, to try to shape and make something, um, we want it to feel, as Keats said, as natural as leaves come to a tree, right? Um, and uh, yeah, you want it to feel real and alive and human. And, or and the romantic were reacting strongly against the French Revolution, right? I mean, they were yeah. the French Revolution was supposed to be the European version of now all of our reason will yeah. get us exactly where we need to be by intellect. And yeah. after that had gone very wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, a bunch of people yeah. in Germany were like, maybe we should trust our feelings, and maybe yeah, it's okay if things contradict each other, and maybe, you know. Yeah. And, and so you sort of you, but yeah, I mean that that romantic movement is very much a pushback um, against you know what we would maybe call like the smartest guys in the room theory, right? That that if yeah. if all of the people who are so smart got us to this place. Maybe we need a different way forward. Maybe we need different yeah. kinds of um, no understanding. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. Yep. So in terms of storytelling, I've always wondered, um, and, and maybe I'll ask you this, is it possible not to tell stories? Is it possible to like, can you, can, because I was, I mean, you know, I, I've been researching um, the history of writing and kind of, you know, the working on sort of what um, writing is and has done, particularly because of my interest in the poetic line um, and sort of trying to figure out where that came from um, and what it's doing when we use it. Um, but one of the things that I think is really interesting is that in a lot of that research, there's this, there's this idea that I think is true, that language is instinctual, but writing is a technology. Um, and I, and I, I wonder, like, is story instinctual? Like, is story something that you cannot do? It's mm. a great question. Uh, just two quick anecdotes. One is that years ago when I was a TA in a film theory course, I was watching some German experimental films, and I, I, alas, I can't remember the, the director, but one of the projects of this director was to drain cinema of narrative. Uh, to try to create, to do something pure with the image. Um, and it may just be a, a personal flaw on my part, but I couldn't help but create narratives every time I looked at those movies. I kept seeing stories. Uh, and, and so I really do wonder if it's possible to create much. I've seen some video art that sure does seem to deny the possibility of stories, so maybe I'm wrong about it. The, the poet B.H. Fairchild, who's a great storyteller, um, talks about uh, 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 scientific uh, observations of, the, of dream and the brain and, and asserts that we don't dream in coherent narratives. We dream in flashes of impulse and image, right? And what the brain is doing is working all night long to try to make narratives out of those dreams. And perhaps sometimes when we wake up exhausted in the morning, it's because we're tired of trying to make us make a narrative out of that. But the implication is that the human brain is a storytelling animal, hmm. is, is a narrative maker. And that people who deny narrative are working against nature in a way, rather hmm. than 
in sync with nature. It's possible. It makes me think, yeah, a little bit about the difference between story and, and um, like meaning, meaning making, um, which brings me to Gertrude Stein. Yeah, I was thinking also about experimental avant-garde, whether it was film or the language movement or Stein and the sort of, I remember there was some exercise, um, Tan Lin, language experimental poet had given in a workshop inspired by Stein and Tan asked us to come up with two words of equal words that sort of had a similar feel like a like like cormorant candy bar or something had a similar kind of feel but when you put them together they made no meaning you know can you work against me you know this is sort of a way to get us thinking about experimental avant-garde language you know stuff right like can you find two I, words <laughs> the course what do you mean they have no meaning? The cormorant ate the candy bar. I mean, you know. Right. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this was, a, this was another great, I keep thinking about my students, but another great activity I do with my students. Okay, go for a, two words that, and then they, they can make no sense. You need to intentionally make no sense. Yeah. And just how hard the brain, you know, and then that's our entryway into thinking about Stein's work and all of that. And yeah. um, But that's a great, yeah. The, how do you the, feel about Stein? <laughs> how do I feel about Stein? I know, I just <laughs> quickly, how do you feel about Stein? Yeah, but how, I, I, I assigned I, Stein, I, I had a student who was working in something and I, I said, well, if you're going to do that, then you might as well go back to Stein. And after he read the book, he was like, why did you do that to me? Yeah. Uh, but then, no, but then two, you know, two packets later in a low res program, he was thrilled by Stein and had kind of like yeah. come on the other side. Yeah. So I was just wondering, I, like sort of. I, I think her book, Paris, France is absolutely charming. Uh, you know, and and three women, and, or three three lives, or three women, I think three good. lives, um, and and the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, wonderful. Tender Buttons loses me after a while. I can't stay with it forever. But nah, I, it's you know, it, it's 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 like gradations between writing and orality, right? There are gradations of Stein, and I suppose the narrative Stein charms me more than the non-narrative Stein. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes, I, I, as we're speaking, I realize I go to Stein to sometimes just clean my mind, you know, and, and, and just kind of like give it a jolt, you know, I think it, like Stein, Paul Ceylon, and like yeah. Teresa Hockin Cha, <laughs> like these are, you know, these kind of just writers who over the years I've, re I return to if I just need to just reset and wake up to language. But I think my some of my students have the same response. It's the, that wrestling with Stein. But I, I still assign <laughs> still assign Stein. <laughs> yeah. I I mean I, I also I also think it's often really helpful to figure out what something is by seeing what it's not. Yes. And that by by going to Stein and sort of being like, look, <laughs> there are other options. It actually can open more spaces and other mm -hmm. kinds of um, modes, other sort of ways of of writing or communicating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think also that, um, you know, the, the other sort of half of that question was sort of a postmodernist question, right? That, that if, um, we're os if we sort of oscillate between the kind of need for narrative and a need for nonsense, um, both like kind of just in our individual reading lives, but also kind of culturally, um, where do you see us in that kind of oscillation now? Mm -hmm. like where are we in terms of I, we're, we're coming into the end, so I'll ask like the really big question. Um, would, would you assess? I mean, do you, do you think that there's something sort of to be said about where American poetry is, or maybe Anglophone poetry it would be a better um, way to phrase it, where Anglophone poetry is regarding narrative um, at this time? You know, yeah, I don't know if I could, yeah, of course, you know, do that kind of like big assessments, um, but it, I, I will say I'm excited by poets who are in some ways really going against the narrative impulse in a way like that, you know, I'm noticing a lot of, um, like I think about Laylee Long Soldier or Tongo Eisen Martin or Anthony Cody or just some of these, it feels like um, there's an interest right now in, in, in challenging right kind of the master narratives of of culture right and you have these voices who've been writing from the margins for so long who are coming in with this just these beautiful expressions doing that kind of 
challenging and and maybe it's new stories they're bringing um we're all bringing you know maybe it's the new stories and but maybe it's also a um a challenge to to, to story in general and this 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 kind of these these narratives that we've in narratives of oppression or capitalism or destruction of the environment, like just you know, these larger narratives that have um, shaped this moment and these poets who are just so alive with language um, and sort of challenging those, those narratives. So that's, that's exciting to me right now to see. Yeah. The only thing I'd observe about what you're saying, Bryn, is that, is that to challenge the master narratives you're, involves you in narrative. And Laylee Long, so I mean, whereas is chock full of narrative, you know, and the most powerful short poem in that book, 38, about the execution of, of, uh, of Lakota people uh, in Abe Lincoln's term in office um, is, is, is a story. And mm -hmm. wow, what a story. I mean, it's just told like with such power. Um, so yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think I think narrative isn't going to go away, yeah. uh, but but I love the effort to find new ways into narrative, new ways of telling stories, and and structuring them, and and uh, they're all valid, and then the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in what kind of a poem and what kind of an experience do you want to have? Do you want to have? Uh, an oral experience that will be immediately apprehensible at some level to an audience of people on one hearing, or do you want to have something that's difficult to work through uh, and uh, will be only perceived by somebody who has studied it for 30 years? I mean, we're, we're still in that kind of axis of literary experiences. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jason? <laughs> Um, I think that there are sort of two ways to react when you're left out of stories. And I think one of them is to tell your own story. And I think one of them is to attack storytelling. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there are really powerful ways in which um, there are new voices that are speaking in really new ways um, and telling stories often that are quite familiar that never really got quite the attention um, but then there's also kind of a desire to sort of blow up the language that didn't include you yeah. mm -hmm. and to kind of write in these ways that, uh, and that, that's actually what I see Stein is doing. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, see, I kind of see Stein as sort of saying that all of these categories of person and all of these categories of being um, don't work for me and I'm going to take a hammer and chisel to them. And I, and I often find, um, I mean, my favorite Stein is quite erotic. And I never know if it's actually erotic or if I'm just projecting that. <laughs> uh, because, you know, one of the things that happens when you, when you blow up meaning is um, you lose some of that shared foundation. But then I think um, that, that's why there's this kind of oscillation that you kind of move back and forth between it. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, do, I do think there's, there's a real hunger for narrative right now. I, th I think that people are really, really excited about telling stories. Mm -hmm. But at the same time that people are really excited about erasures, at the same time that people are really excited about kind of identifying, you know, just what the, the, what the diction and the tone is. So I, I actually think that American poetry may be... Um, I, I once read an article which claimed that um, poetry... One could not speak of a mainstream in English language poetry after 1870. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, I guess I guess the fragmentation has been going on a while, um, and and so I, I feel that way now. I mean, I feel like there's there's a really exciting um, energy around all sorts of things, and I'm I'm sort of waiting to see where all the the dust settles. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm really, I I feel like I'll have a better handle on it ten years from now. I would say the dust will never settle. As the old guy in the room, the dust will never settle. <laughs> and that's and that's one of the best things about stories, yeah. is that stories end. Um, yeah. I mean, as as you said in, in your first poem, I mean, one of the things that's so one of the reasons I, I really truly believe that one of the reasons that humans need stories so badly 
um, is because it's the only thing that comforts us because our actual lives are so ongoing. Mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> you really need to close the, I mean, if you think about the difference between, you know, even something incredibly long like Middlemarch um, or, or Don Juan, you know, when you close the back cover of that book, you've completed something. Whereas with mm -hmm. Twitter, the endless scroll, it, it will drive you, it will, it will drive you mad if, if you stay yeah. there too long. And the person who invented the the because it wasn't always a bottomless scroll. The original technology required you to refresh the page and to reload a page. Um, wow. And the guy who invented the bottomless scroll is sorry. He's <laughs> he's he's trying to use his technology for good now, but he knows what he did. He's sorry. <laughs> Speaking of needing yeah. stories in the time of chaos, I think you're helping me understand why I've been watching so much TV and just movies, like, yeah. like, yeah. like during this time of yeah, just just a lot of stress for a lot of us, and um, just this craving for narrative certainty and and closure. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I'm getting it now. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's really it's it's so important. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I, I, th I mean, I'm not the only person who's saying this, but you know, the fact that our stories, do, would you like more Star Wars? You know, would you like another Star Wars prequel? Oh, you thought they were done? No, no. Would you like more Star Wars? <laughs> um, it, it's, it's really bad for us. Like it's really bad. Um, and it's, it's preventing the construction of meaning. Mm. That the endings of stories are, are what gives stories meaning. Not they're not the only thing that gives stories meaning, but, but a really, a really structural piece of the meaning of a story is where it ends. And let me um, just throw in that that's why criticism, literary criticism, or film criticism is important. People need help finding real stories, real true stories. You know, and all the great storytellers talk about trying to say something true. You know, I mean, everybody's talking about Hemingway now because of the film about him, but that was his whole aesthetic. Try to say something true. Uh, and at its best, it's quite beautiful, quite astonishing. Uh, you know, and then it became false, uh, you know, as he, as he sort of became a parody of himself. But we, we do need people to, to think about these things. We need help to get out of that loop of Marvel Comics movies, you know, and, and that trivialization of, uh, of what's possible in human experience. Uh, so God bless the critics, the good ones. Well, let's give some meaning to our conversation and end it. Yeah. <laughs> We're in time. Yeah. So on, yeah. that, on that beautiful note, um, Toby, Monica, do you wanna come back in and- uh, Hello. Hello. Uh, Thank you guys so much. That was an incredible conversation. Um, I loved hearing just all about that and, and the meaning in stories. And um, Jason, what you literally just said about how the meaning of stories comes from from ending ending them, and then that ongoing stories kind of prevents us from finding the creativity in them. Like I connected with that a lot because I'm also a writer, and I haven't been able to write because I'm continually just scrolling on Twitter or just mindlessly doing other things. Um, and I, I just never sit with myself long enough to find that meaning in stories again. So uh, thank you for saying that because now I am completely <laughs> inspired to, to go back and just like slow down and sit with myself now. So thank all three of you. It was an incredible, incredible conversation. I well, really thank you all so much. Uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Great pleasure. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have uh, so many more incredible events coming up over the next few months. You can join us on April 21st at the new time of 5 o'clock uh, Pacific time uh, for the first of our Hen House at Home Spring Tours featuring poets Kalisa Ray, Nikki Mustaki, and Allison Joseph. And our uh, NEH reading and conversation series continues on April 28th at 4 p.m. PT with Victoria Chang and Afa Weaver. We will see you then. See you then. Thank you, guys.